We will be at some point this morning in Joshua chapter 4. Joshua chapter 4 verse 4. But we will not start there. That's going to be our main staying place, but that ain't where we're going to start. This is kind of a messed up little deal God has put in my mind this morning. And it don't lay out like everything always lays out. And it makes me uncomfortable when it's that way. Because it's supposed to be a certain way. You know what I mean? It's supposed to be this, this, and this, and this note, and that note, and this one ain't that way. So go and mark Joshua chapter 4, verse 4. Put your finger on that, because that's where we're eventually going to end up. But we're actually going to, we're going to, we're going to read that, Joshua 4, 4 through 7. And then we're going to go some totally different place. So we're going to start in Joshua 4, 4 through 7. Joshua chapter 4, starting in verse 4. Then Joshua called the twelve men whom he had appointed from the children of Israel, one man from every tribe. And Joshua said to them, Cross over before the ark of the Lord your God into the midst of the Jordan, and each one of you take up a stone on his shoulder according to the number of the tribes of the children of Israel, that this may be a sign among you when your children ask in time to come, saying, What do these stones mean to you? Then you shall answer them that the waters of the Jordan were cut off before the ark of the covenant of the Lord when it crossed over the Jordan. The waters of the Jordan were cut off and these stones shall be for a memorial to the children of Israel forever. Let's pray. Father and our God, we do humble ourselves this morning before you to say thank you. Thank you, Father, for your grace and mercy. Thank you, Father, that you loved us while we were yet sinners. Father, I thank you that we take time tomorrow to remember men and women who have given their life that we may have the freedoms that we have in this country. I thank you, Father, for your grace and your mercy that allows us to reside in such a place. Father, where people are willing to sacrifice everything for the cause of this great nation. Father, we ask that you would be in our midst this morning, that you would watch over every one of us, that you would have your will in your way in all that's said and done. Father, we thank you, we love you, and we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Exodus chapter 15, verse 22. In um, thinking about Memorial Day, I kind of ask myself, why was it necessary for us to have a particular day to remember any particular thing? And the response I got was, because we're a forgetful people. And we have been for, since the beginning of time, we're forgetful. As a matter of fact, me personally, I'm probably one of the most forgetful folks there, there is ever. If I don't write it down and keep a note with me, if I don't set an alarm of some kind, I'm not going to remember it day to day. And I'm just talking about stuff. I'm going I'm to give you an example of how forgetful I am and how quick I forget things. I'm sure some of you can relate probably not to this extent, I hope. Monday mornings is trash day at my house. It's garbage day. It's the day the garbage man comes and picks up the garbage at the end of the road. It's Monday. It's every Monday. It's been every Monday since I've lived where I live now for about 18 years. Every Monday. I drive a company vehicle, a service truck, an F-550 Ford pile of junk with a service bed on the back of it. And I've only been in that truck probably a year or so. Every Monday, though, I've went to behind my house and grabbed my garbage can, put it in the back of my truck, and stopped at the end of the road and put it... Most Mondays, I just drag it from behind the house to the road because of the story I'm about to tell you. 
One particular Monday not too long ago, I got up, I got the garbage from behind the house, and instead of taking it to the road, I set it on the back of the service truck, the big garbage can and one big bag that wouldn't fit in the can. My intentions were to get in the truck and drive the very long distance to the end of my driveway and set out that bag of garbage in that garbage can. The end of my driveway is about from where I stand to that wall from where I parked. So it's a great distance. You can see how a man would get in the predicament I'm about to tell you I got in. So I put the garbage can, uh, by the way, a new garbage can that my wife had just purchased just a few short weeks before this tragic event. I put that garbage can on the back bumper of that service truck, and I put that bag on the back bumper of the service truck, and I got in the service truck, and I went to work. And about an hour later, my wife called me, and she said, did you take the garbage to the road this morning? And I said, I made every preparation to do so. But the answer to your question would be no, because as I can recall, I didn't stop at the end of our driveway. She said, well, I was just coming down the road, and I seen this big, pretty garbage can look just like the one I just bought about three weeks ago, laying on the side on, in the middle of the road between where you are and where I am. And I said, sweetheart, that would be our garbage can. <laughs> would you please go get it? <laughs> the things are expensive. It wasn't there anymore. That was the old one. I had already lost the new one. <laughs> to retell my story, this has happened to me twice. <laughs> the new garbage can really wasn't there. The old one was. But you can see how forgetful we are. And again, you have an example of this. and you're, It may not be that I hope it's a further distance from here where I'm standing to that wall for you to forget to stop at the end of the driveway and take the garbage off the back of the truck. I hope and I pray. But I can assure you in some shape, form, or fashion, you have a story related to your bad memory. Because we all have it. We don't do good at remembering things. We don't. We forget. And it's been that way for a long time. As a matter of fact, God had taken Israel out of of captivity with the Egyptians. On that journey, they had to cross the Red Sea, right? God split the waters of the sea and the children of the if Israel went across on dry ground and the Egyptians, their enemies behind them, were swallowed up by the sea. Is there any explanation for that other than a miracle of God, an act of God? No explanation, right? That stuff don't happen. I don't know about you. I've been here about 40 years. I ain't never seen nothing even comparative to that. Do you realize those people forgot that event? Those people that walked across the Red Sea on dry ground, got to the other side, turned around and watched their enemies be swallowed up by that water. Their horses, their chariots, their men, the whole army absolutely, utterly destroyed and swallowed up by the sea, they forgot. They forgot they seen that. Could you ever forget that you've seen that? Don't say no. After that, they were celebrating. They were, they were singing the song. David, I mean Moses writes a song. They sing that song. It's in Exodus chapter 15. In Exodus chapter, six, uh, chapter 15, verse 22. So Moses brought Israel from the Red Sea. Then they went out into the wilderness of Shur. 
And they went three days in the wilderness. That gives you a timeline. That's a little bit further from where I stand to the wall, but it ain't far. The significance of the miracle they just seen is pretty significant. They just watched God part the Red Sea. They crossed on dry ground. Their enemies are swallowed up behind them by the same sea that was held up on their behalf. Have you got me so far? They come out, sing a song, and they go three days. All right? They went three days in the wilderness and found no water. Now when they came to Marah, they could not drink the waters of Marah, for they were bitter. Therefore the name of it was called Marah. And the people complained against Moses, saying, what, saying, what shall we drink? They just watched a miracle of God take place in their lives that nobody else has ever seen nor will ever see again. Three days later, they're complaining that they're thirsty. Are you with me so far? Are you awake to this point? I need some sign of life from the audience besides the kids. You know what I'm saying? Okay. So... So he cried out, Moses cried out to the Lord and the Lord showed him a tree. Uh, when he cast it into the waters, the waters were made sweet. All right, so they just went from this miracle. They go three days. Three days after this miracle, we're complaining that we ain't got nothing to drink. Now God gives, tells Moses, take a limb off of this tree, throw that limb in the water. When it hits the water, the water's drinkable. Miracle number two. You got that? So they went from seeing a miracle to complaining about a miracle, complaining about needing a miracle, and got a miracle. You got that? Three days all that took place. Here we go again. Um, Exodus chapter 16, verse 1. And they journeyed from Elam, and all the congregation of the children of Israel came to the wilderness of Sin which is between Elam and Sinai on the 15th day of the second month after they departed from the land of Egypt. Then the whole congregation of the children of Israel complained against Moses and Aaron in the wilderness. And the children of Israel said to them, Oh, that we had died by the hand of the Lord in the land of Egypt. When we sat by the pots of meat... And when we ate bread to the full, for you have brought us out into the wilderness to kill this whole assembly with hunger. We've seen the Red Sea part. We got water that was drinkable, that used to not be drinkable. Now they're sitting down, squalling out, crying, whiny baby voice, if you'd have just left us in Egypt, we'd have rather died at the hands of our enemies by the pots full of meat and the bread in our bellies than to have you to bring us out into the wilderness and let all of us starve to death. They forgot. They forgot already about the Red Sea. They forgot about the bittersweet change to drink, uh, bitter waters made drinkable. Now we're crying about food. This ain't but just a few months. This journey's just beginning. <laughs> then, uh, verse 4, Then the Lord said to Moses, Behold, I will rain bread from heaven for you, and the people shall go out and gather a certain quota every day. Do you know how long that took place? Forty years, the whole time they were there. Every day they had, they had, they had bread, every day. They, they, they forgot about the Red Sea. They, they forgot about the water. They complained about the bread. They forget about that eventually, and they start complaining because they don't have meat. That's more towards the end of the journey. We won't go there right now. How can you be that forgetful? 
How can you be so forgetful that God does a miraculous thing in your life? Three days later, you're whining and crying because you're thirsty. Why don't you just look up to the God who opened up the sea and say, May I have something to drink? Why, why do you have to go to Moses and cry and whine about how thirsty you are? Why do you then turn around and go to Moses and go, Listen, we'd have been better off to die in Egypt at the hand of our enemies with our bellies full than to come out here and let y'all starve us to death. How do you forget so quickly? Now for 40 years it rained bread. For 40 years these people were fed. These folks are some very, very forgetful people. Go over to Exodus 17 to be our last stop in Exodus. Exodus 17, 1 and 2. When all the congregation of the children of Israel set out on their journey from the wilderness of sin according to the commandment of the Lord and camped in Rephidim, but there was no water for the people to drink. Here we are again. Now, these other three that I've mentioned were not really connected directly, and I thought maybe... You could find somewhere where, you know, they ran out of water again and their mindset and attitude would be different. Let's see. Therefore the people contended with Moses and said, Give us water that we may drink. So Moses said to them, Why do you contend with me? Why do you tempt the Lord? And the people thirsted there for water and the people complained against Moses and said, Why is it you have brought us up out of Egypt to kill us? and our children, and our livestock with thirst. My goodness, what a, what a pleasant group of people to be around. Huh? Wouldn't this be a great, great group of people to spend time with? What would you say they do with the majority of their time just looking at what we know of the story to this point? Complain. Oh, me. Oh, bother. I mean, they, I mean, they have so many things to celebrate. They crossed the Red Sea on dry ground, and then they started complaining because they were thirsty. They got water, and they started complaining because they were hungry. Then they started complaining again because they had to move, and they got to another place where there was no water. These are God's chosen people. These are the children of Israel. These are people that have promises to claim. And you know what they look like? Somebody just stole their best puppy dog. They, they bottom lips curled out so far they step on it with every other step. Have you ever met anybody like that? Don't call their name. <laughs> Have you ever been in church with somebody like that? Don't point at them. What is the, what is, what is the deal? <laughs> Why do we for so forgetful for what God has done for us? Why do we need memorials? Why do we need things to remind us? Why do we need a special day marked on the calendar so that we don't forget? What's our problem? Why, why are we so apt to complain? Why, why is it so easy for us to forget what God has already done to the point that we look at the next thing and go, Wow, what will I do now? I guess I'll sit here and die. And not remember that God has just done all these miraculous things. Why is this all of a sudden bigger than God? It's not. We're just forgetful. Go with me to Joshua. Let's get started this morning. Joshua chapter 4, verse 4. Why in the world would these people need a reminder? Look at the miraculous things they've seen, their parents have been involved in. Look at this, look at this, look at this. Joshua chapter 4. Joshua, this 1 through 3 is God giving Joshua the commands that Joshua was about to give to the people. Then Joshua called the 12 men whom he had appointed from the children of Israel, one man from every tribe, and Joshua said to them, Cross over before the ark of the Lord your God into the midst of the Jordan. Each one of you take up a stone on his shoulder according to the number of tribes of the children of Israel. Here's what we're going to do. They've been given the command. They've been told, this is it. Moses has died. Joshua's in charge. They're going into the promised land. Take up the Ark of the Covenant. Go down to the Jordan River. On your way to the Jordan River, if the people carrying the Ark of the Covenant get to the edge of the river, the river is going to stand up. When the river stands up, get the Ark of the Covenant to the middle. Everybody else go through, cross over. 
the Jordan River. Once everybody's crossed over, the Ark of the Covenant comes out, the waters go back to flowing. That's what's going to happen. That's the promise that's been given them. The people carrying the Ark of the Covenant, if you go back and read that part of the story, they get to the river and get their feet wet. They took one step into the river, the walls from upstream, the water from upstream stood up like a wall and quit flowing. Y'all ever been to the aquarium where you could stand and look into the water and see things that you can't see from above the water? The fish, the sharks, all this stuff. That's what these people experienced. The Jordan River stood up like a wall and they could see into it. The ark of the co- the people carrying the covenant, first of all, don't miss, I'm trying not to preach this message again, don't miss the fact that the people carrying the ark had to get their feet wet in order for this miracle to take place. If they had stopped short of the river, they'd never see the miracle. They had, to, they had to be confident in what God had told them. And as they're carrying this Ark of the Covenant, they step into the water, and the water stands up like a wall. It quits flowing. It's dry ground. Not till they got their feet wet, though. Some of us want to pray right up to, and we don't pray through, and that's a different message for a different time. These folks have see, are seeing this. This is what's taking place. And he says, now as this takes place, here's what I need. I need one man from each tribe, 12 men, leaders of the, of the tribes. I need you to grab up a stone as you cross over the Jordan. I need you to grab up a stone and carry it with you. We're going to do something else with that. We're going to put that on the other side. Grab you a stone as you go through. Look at this. Look at the significance of these things. Cross over before the ark. First of all, you must understand that the presence of God is necessary for the miracles of God. The presence of God is necessary for the miracles of God. In other words, you can't walk through this life ignoring everything God's telling you and expect to experience the miracles of God in your life. Not going to happen. The presence of God, the Ark of the Covenant, represented the presence of God. And the instruction was for the Ark to be carried out into the river. And when it got out there, the wall of water would stand up. The waters would quit flowing downstream. And, and, and God's presence made that happen. So in order for you to see the miracles of God, you've got to have God in your life. You can't walk away from Him. You can't go out here and live the way you want to live in the absence of God and expect to see the miracles of God. It's not going to happen. So the first thing you need to understand in order to see the miracles of God, you've got to be standing in the presence of God. Got to be. No two ways about that. I want you to look at the next thing. This kind of struck me as funny. In verse 5. Cross over before the ark of the Lord your God into the midst of the Jordan, each one of you take up a stone on his shoulder. Not a rock. A stone. You see that, right? On his shoulder. He didn't, this ain't David's stones that he used against Goliath where he took four or five of them and put them in a pouch. This is a stone they had, each one had to pick up and put on their shoulder. Now I want to tell you something. If God spoke to about half of us right now today and told us to go out here and pick up a stone carried on our shoulder, we'd go, I'm tired. <laughs> My back hurts. <laughs> huh? What? That, yeah, I know. Y'all being quiet. Listen. Sometimes the thing God tells us to do that's leading up to a miracle, we don't feel like doing it don't make sense. I can imagine the 12 guys, if I was to make that announcement here today, I would get these responses. A stone? What's a stone? Get on. I'm tired. I'm, I'm, I'm tired. Wore- you don't realize what I've done all week, Pastor. You don't realize how much I've done this week, Pastor. I don't care. God said get a stone on your shoulder and carry it. You realize that these 12 stones were picked out by 12 individuals which meant that the personality of each individual was was going to be placed in this memorial. One guy goes out there and looks at the the rocks and the stones and he's rubbing on it and trying to find the slickest, smoothest, prettiest thing he can find that he can get on his shoulder and get out. The next guy's in there looking for the squarest, most rigid, most rugged, the thing that represents his rugged attitude and his rugged 
um, um, sense of himself that he can find. The next guy's out there looking for one that's the easiest to carry, not because of its size, because it's got this neat little handle on the side. And he puts that on. One guy's looking for the one that looks the most like a ball. You see what I'm telling you? All of these guys, individuals, went out and picked up individual stones that were so big they had to carry them on their shoulders. We're going to take these 12 stones that are so big, they have to be, and we're going to put them in a pile. So that you'll never forget that God made the river stand up and you to walk across. If an event that significant can be forgotten, how much more can the acts of God in our individual lives be forgotten? And as individuals, you need to set up memorials at times. You need to put up things. Let's keep going. I'm getting ahead of myself. In verse 6, That is, that this may be a sign among you when your children ask in time to come, saying, what do these stones mean to you? We're going to stack these up. We're going to build this uh, memorial so that generations to come will ask, what does this mean? And you'll have the opportunity to tell them what God done. So this memorial is the eye-catching. This memorial is to cause people to ask questions. Memorials in your life, what are you leaving behind that cause your children to ask you questions that give you an opportunity to tell them what God has done in your life? What are you setting up? What are you establishing? What are you leaving behind? What, what, what things has God done in your life that you've done forgot about? What miracles has God done in your life that you look at it today and that day it was the most miraculous thing ever but today you, you can barely even remember the story. How, what things are you setting up so that when miraculous, no way to explain it, but God did it, things happen in your life. What are you setting up so that years to come, years down the road, people will see it and say, what's that mean? And you get the opportunity to tell them what God has done in your life. Because if you think you're going to remember it, a generation from now, if you think you're going to remember it a month from now, you're probably mistaken. They couldn't remember to tell, that they couldn't remember three days later what God had done to the point that they wouldn't complain about being thirsty. We're the same way. We do the same thing. We see this great miracle in our lives and three days later we're complaining about something else. Three days later we're, we're, we're questioning what God's doing today. When it ain't been that long ago he just got through doing this great big miracle and he's sitting up there going, oh, you, don't you remember? Don't, don't you remember what I did? Don't you remember what I've done for you? Don't you remember what I've done through you? And today you question whether I'm going to let you starve? Today you question whether I'm capable of even be meeting the most basic needs in your life when just last week I've done this miraculous thing. We're forgetful. We're forgetful. We're very forgetful. Keep going with me. We're almost there. Verse 7. Then you shall answer them that the waters of the Jordan were cut off before the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord when it crossed over the Jordan. The waters of the Jordan were cut off and the stones shall be for a memorial to the children of Israel forever. Whatever you set up, whatever you establish, you better have a specific answer when somebody asks. You should be willing and able to tell what God has done in your life. It, with specifics because those are the things that have the most impact on the next person the next generation the person you're having the opportunity to tell these things to it ain't because they think you're a great storyteller it's because God needs to get glory from it so that they can see the glory of God in your life and desire that same glory in their life you've got to be setting up memorials and, and answer, making people ask questions and being willing to answer those questions. Uh, here we go. Joshua 4, 10 through 13. All this took place. 
Hey, there's something here. I may not should bring it up. Kind of caught me off guard. I ain't never seen it before. In verse 8, And the children of Israel did so just as Joshua commanded, took up twelve um, stones from the midst of the Jordan. As the Lord had spoken to Joshua, according to the number of the tribes, the children of Israel carried them over, placed it where they lodged, and laid them down there. Then Joshua set up twelve stones in the midst of the Jordan, in the place where the feet of the priests who bore the Ark of the Covenant stood. And they are there to this day. Joshua, while the children are do, carrying out what they've been told to do, they've picked up these stones they have to carry on their shoulder to take them out of the river, to put them at the first place that they camped that night. In the meantime, Joshua is picking up 12 stones and placing them at the feet of where the men stood who were carrying the Ark of the Covenant. He's like marking out a spot. And according to Scripture, now this is in the riverbed. According to Scripture, they're still there to this day. There's some significance in that that my mind can't wrap around this morning. There's some significance there. I asked myself as many questions as I could while I was studying this to try to figure that out, and I didn't come up with it. That may be for a reason. I'm bad to talk about stuff that ain't got nothing to do with nothing else. So the priests who bore the ark stood in the midst of the Jordan until everything was finished that the Lord had commanded Joshua to speak to the people according to all that Moses had commanded Joshua and the people hurried and crossed over. They brought the Ark of the Covenant into the middle. The presence of God is necessary for the miracles of God. And when, when they stood in the middle of the Jordan with the Ark of the Covenant, with the presence of God, until everything that was supposed to happen, happened. They didn't quit early. They didn't stop early. They didn't get tired. They didn't sit down. They stayed there until everything was completed. The people hurried across. Now hang on a minute. How long does it take 15 people to cross the Jordan River? We ain't talking about 15 people. We're talking about an army of 40,000. If you keep reading right here. People ready for war. So that's going to be your men of valor. Your mature men is 40,000. Plus their wives, children, and, and everybody that ain't ready. I mean, at a rough guesstimation, I mean, there, there's 100,000 people. It took a little while. Them folks probably got tired. They didn't quit. They had to stay right where they was at until the miracle was complete. If not, people lose their lives. Until everything was finished. Until everything was finished. Then it came to pass, when all the people had completely crossed over, that the ark of the Lord and the priests crossed over in the presence of the people, the men of Reuben, the men of Gad, and half the tribe of Manasseh crossed over, armed before the children of Israel as Moses had spoken to them. About 40,000 prepared for war crossed over before the Lord for battle to the plains of Jericho. On that day the Lord exalted Joshua in the sight of all of Israel, and they feared him as they had feared Moses all the days of his life. How easy is it for you and I to forget the miraculous things God has done in our lives? If these people can go through these things and need a reminder, we probably need a reminder. We probably need to set up a memorial from time to time. We probably need to pick up a stone on our way across the Jordan. It's going to take some extra effort. You're probably going to be tired when it's necessary. Me too. But it's got to be done. Because if we don't set up memorials and we don't remind ourselves to pass these things on to our children, grandchildren, who will? SpongeBob ain't going to do it for you. I'd quit trusting him if I was you. He ain't going to do it. We've got to do it. We've got to take the time and make the effort to pass on the things that we want our kids to have. We want them to remember the great things God has done in our lives so that they can be expecting him to do great things in their lives so that they don't forget. We want them to stay on that path, but we don't do anything to put up fences to keep them on it. 
We want them to stay on that path. We want to raise them up in a way that we can turn them loose one day and trust that God's going to take care of them. But, but we don't really tell them that along the way. We don't really instruct them in that along the way. We rely on other people to do it. It's necessary for us to do it. It's necessary for us to sit down and explain to them what a miracle of God looks like and where they come from, what a promise of God looks like and where it comes from so that they can be expecting those things in their lives. We've got to set up memorials. to. I can't even remember to take the garbage can off the back of the truck from where I'm standing to the wall. How will I ever remember to share with her everything God's done in my life? I won't. Not without some markers along the way. Not without some, some purpose to it. And you know what? The day that it's due for me to do it, I'll probably be tired. I'll probably be wore out. i got to do it anyway. I ain't got any choice. I ain't got any choice. Be setting up some markers. Be remembering things. Be looking for things. Look back over your life and remember those miracles. They're easy to forget. They're easy to forget. Listen, tomorrow's Memorial Day. A day of remembrance for remembering those that gave the ultimate sacrifice that we may have experienced the freedoms that we do in this country. So today may be a good day to start remembering the things God has done in your life and set up a few little markers, write them down somewhere, make a book, do something. Because if you don't, you're going to forget and never remember and then the people behind you won't know. You've got to have some memorials. You've got to have some markers along the way. You've got to have things that cause people to ask questions that open up an opportunity for you to have conversation. You better be ready with a specific answer. They need to hear it. They need to hear it. They're hearing all this other garbage. They need to be hearing this stuff. Let's pray. Father and our God, we do come to you to say thank you again for this day. We ask you, Father, to continue to be with us through the remainder of our services. I pray, Father, that your word has been spoken this morning. I pray, Father, that um, you are, are continually guiding us as individuals and as a body of believers. Father, I lift up uh, Sean to you this morning. I pray that you continue to watch over him as, as he's doing what you've called him to do in a, in a different location. And I just pray for your presence to be known and felt. Father, I thank you. I, I pray for your guidance and your direction as we leave this place today. I pray, Father, that you show us how to apply these scriptures. It's nice to know them. It's nice to talk about them, Father, but it ain't nothing like living them. And I just pray that you show us ways to do that, that we can apply this and live this out in a way that it brings glory to you. We thank you. We love you. We pray these things in Jesus' name.